We're going to design one last state machine based on the Moore configuration, the Moore state machine. This one is going to do pattern detection. Now, when I'm talking about pattern detection, let's just take, for example, a, um, an Ethernet interface. So you've got a series of ones and zeros that are passing from one device to another device, and the receiving device needs to have some way to synchronize itself to specific points in that serial stream of ones and zeros. Um, for example, Ethernet, we're gonna, we're, whenever, you, whenever you start a message with Ethernet, you basically get this 1010, this, this stream of one one zero one zero one zero one zero seven bytes of nothing but one zero one zero one zero and then the last byte which is referred to as the start delimiter goes one zero one zero one zero and then one one and so there has to be some sort of a circuit on the receiving end device that's looking for that pattern and so, you know, as these bits are coming in, because those bits are used for synchronization, they're used to synchronize a system so that, um, you know, so that all the receiving devices know, okay, here's the next bit, here's the next bit, here's the next bit. They may synchronize at any time for this series, but so we don't know exactly how many of these 1010s we're going to receive before the message starts. So there has to be a unique pattern that tells us that this sequence is going to be received that 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 the very next bit there's the addressing information so um, the 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 device or the state machine that we are going to be designing is going to detect a pattern of three bits now it's not going to be the same three bits what we're going to look for is the pattern one one zero those three bits now um, there are eight ways we could have organized those three bits. That's just the one that I picked. Now, how do we start? Remember that we always start with some sort of an initial or reset state. Now, in this case, what we're going to do is, is um, and by the way, I didn't tell you what the, the system design is, did I? So what we've got is an input, a stream of bits, that's going to be D, and then we're going to have an output F for found. And so if I've got this pattern of ones and zeros that I'm receiving, you can see that the pattern is here. Let's see, there's another one here, there's another one here, and there's another one here. And this is going to be what's coming in on D. And the clock that's ticking away, remember the clock that's driving the state machine, is going to be synchronized to the bits. So every time a bit comes in, we'll get a clock pulse that'll bring us to the next state. New bit, new clock pulse. New bit, new clock pulse. Now our output, F, that is going to remain a zero. And it's going to remain a zero until we know that we've received all three bits of the pattern. So it stays zero, stays zero, and then when we get that third bit, we've got the pattern output a one. Then immediately it goes back to zero and stays a zero until we get that one. All right, and goes back to a zero and then a one. And then it goes back to a zero until we get that one. Uh, I don't know if I've got the right number of bits up there, but you get the idea, all right? So this is what we're going to design. Figured I'd review that before we start really getting into the details of the state diagram. Now, what does the state diagram look like? The reset state is going to be assuming that we haven't received any bits yet. So, no bits at all. And let's see, I'll do my thing where I put a line across there in order to identify the name of the state on the top half, the output of the state on the bottom half. So, um, this reset state we're going to call no bits. In other words, I haven't received, I assume that I have not received any bits of the pattern yet. All right. Now we get a clock pulse and a D comes in and the D is either a one or a zero. Now our pattern starts with a one. So if we receive a zero, we know we still don't have any bits of the pattern. So as long as we keep receiving zeros, as long as D is equal to a zero, 
we're going to stay. If I get a long string of zeros, I'm going to stay in the no bits received state. All right. Now, we get a one. A one comes in. Now, we don't know if this one corresponds to the first bit of the sequence or not, but it could. So we go to a new state. Now I'm going to call this new state, I'm going to give it a kind of, kind of a long name. Might have first bit. I don't know if I could quite fit that in there, but I said it, so hopefully you know what I've written in there. I might have the first bit. F still has to equal zero because we don't know if we've received the, the sequence yet. But if we receive a one, this one might be the first bit of the pattern, all right? So I've got my d equals zero and my d equals one. All the possible ways we can have our input set, zero or one, we've got transitions coming out of that first state. Now let's look at the second state. The second state, the one might have first bit, that one, when we're in that state, what is the possibility, you know, we, we, once again, we have either a zero or a one that, that could be bringing us out of this state. So if I get a zero, what does that mean? Well, a zero means I received a one, which could have been the first bit, but a zero, that's not the second bit. So clearly we made a mistake by going to the might have first bit. We really don't have anything. And in fact, as long as I'm going 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, I'm just going to go back and forth between these two states. Now, what if I have a 1? Well, if I get a 1, that transition, followed by another 1, I might have the second bit. So we'll have another state here that's called might have second bit. Still, we don't know if we've got the full series, so we're going to have an output of a zero. This occurs if we get a one followed by another one. All right. Now, I've got my zero and one out of this state. I've got my zero and my one out of this state. This state now needs its zero and its one. All right. Now, if I get a zero, what does that mean? Well, it means I got a one followed by a one, followed by a zero, I have the whole sequence. I'm going to put another state here, and I'm going to put found sequence. And that means f equals one. And this happens when I get d equals zero. So that d equals zero means I've got one, one, zero. Found the sequence, all right? Now, that takes care of the d equals zero. What if d equals one there? Well, if d equals one, that means I've got a one, followed by a one, followed by a third one, three ones in a row. Well, three ones in a row is not our sequence, so we can't go to found sequence. But maybe that first one wasn't, the, wasn't part of the sequence, but maybe the last two ones have been part of the sequence. So, as long as I keep receiving ones, I'm just gonna stay in the might have second bit. In other words, I keep a one, a one, and then I keep getting ones. I'm, I'm always gonna, the last two bits I've received, as long as I keep getting ones, the last two bits I've received have always been one, one. Once I get a zero, then I'll know that the last three bits I received were the sequence. All right, so I've got zero and one out of might have second bit. Now I need to figure out what happens if I get a zero and a one out of the found sequence. All right, well a zero, what does that mean? Well a zero means I got at least a one, a one, and a zero followed by another zero. That meant there was a zero following that last zero. That was nothing. Now, we can't even make a sequence out of that. So, d equals zero is going to bring us back to no bits. All right. But what if the bit that's immediately following the sequence was a one? Well, if the bit immediately following the sequence was a one, that could be the first bit of yet another sequence. So, d equals one brings us back to might have first bit. And there you go. There is the full state diagram 
for this system where we're trying to detect the pattern 110. Now, what happens next? Well, remember, the next step, once we've done this system design, was to number the states because we were going to design a state machine where in the middle we've got that memory that contains the state. Well, we've got to be able to number the states so we can have something to store in those memory bits, right? So I'm going to just simply do 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now, something that's important to note very important to note, is that if I numbered these a different way, if I instead had numbered it 0, 1, 2, 3, or 0, 1, 2, 3, or 0, 1, 2, 3, if I had numbered it a different way, guess what? I would have completely different logic. The system would still work the same way, but we'd have very different logic. Why? Because the numbers that I assign to my state bits those would, the orders would change. The transitions and everything would still happen in the same order, but they would go to different, they would go to different uh, state numbers. They go to the right state, but they go to a different number. So for example, if I had numbered this 0, 1, 2, 3, then going from state 0 when d equals 1 would take me to state 3, not state 1. That would change our truth table, which would give us different logic. Different truth table, different logic. All right. Now, this next step was to look at the largest number we've got, which is 3 in this case, convert it to binary, and that shows us that we need 2 bits in order to store our state. I'm going to name them just like I have been naming. This is the low, least significant bit is S0, the next least significant bit is S1, so I'm going to have 2 bits representing each one of these states. All right, guess it's truth table time. All right, the first truth table we're going to make is our output truth table. And the output truth table for a more machine takes the current state, S1, S0, and we're making a truth table to figure out what the output F looks like for that truth table. Now, I've got two inputs. That's four possible patterns of ones and zeros. And remember, because it's the OR machine, because, excuse me, because it's a MORE machine, the output depends only on the state, so we've got a direct mapping from the state number to the output. So 0, 0 outputs a 0, 0, 1 outputs a 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 outputs a 0, and then 1, 1 outputs a 1. And hopefully, that truth table looks really familiar. It's just the AND operation, right? And so what we've got for F, uh, see if I can find a good place to write this down. I'll just put it up here. F is just equal to S1 ANDed with S0. And that is the circuit that's going to take the output from our latch, or excuse me, our D flip-flops, the memory, it's going to take the output, excuse me, the output from the the current state that is stored inside of those D flip-flops and generate our output. All right, let me make some room for our next state truth table. Now for our next state truth table. Now remember, our next state truth table is based on two things. It's based on the current state, what state we're in, and the input. So if you look at the next state truth table, it's got S1 and S0, the current state. So we need to know which one of these circles we're in, along with our input D. The input D is going to identify which one of those transitions we're taking out of that state. And then on the output side, we need to know what the next state is, what state we're going to. And so that's S1 prime and S0 prime. Now, with three inputs, I've got eight possible combinations of ones and zeros. Okay. All right, so these two rows, this represents the no bits. These two rows represents what we're going to do, the two transitions that are coming out of one bit. These two rows, those represent the two transitions coming out of two bits. 
And these two rows right here are the rows coming out of, or the arrows or the transitions coming out of the found state. And so we've got zero and one for each, we've got a, we got a transition for zero and one coming out of each one of those guys. Now, if I'm in state zero, zero, and D equals a zero, I'm in state zero, zero, and D equals a zero, I'm headed back to state zero, zero. If I'm in state zero, zero, and D is equal to a one, I'm in state zero, zero, and D is equal to a one, I'm headed over to state zero, one. Now, if I'm in state zero, one, and D is equal to a zero, in state zero, one, D is equal to a zero, I come back to state zero, zero. If I'm in state zero, one, and D equals a one, I come down to state one, zero. In state one zero, D equals a zero, found the signal, going for one one, moving to state one one. If I'm in state one zero and D equals a one, I just loop back around so I'm staying in one zero. And then coming out of state one one, if I'm in state one one and D is equal to a zero, I'm in state one one, D is equal to a zero, I head up to state zero zero. And lastly, if I'm in state one, one, and D equals a one, I follow this transition up to zero, one. All right. Now, the combination of the output truth table with this next state truth table, those two together have fully digitized this state diagram. Yes, this state diagram has words. A human being can look at this and say, oh yeah, okay, this state is the one where I might have two bits. Uh, the last two bits have been ones. Um, but as far as the electronics is concerned, as far as designing the digital logic, the state di the, the truth tables fully digitize the state diagram. So we don't need this state diagram anymore. Now, one of these days I may get a bigger studio where I can keep that state diagram up there so that whenever we finish our state machine, I can take you through the steps and show you how the state machine actually does or follows exactly what we defined in our state diagram. But until then, we got a race to make, to make more room. So let's come up with a car now map for these two outputs. So I need one car now map for S1 prime. I need another car now map for S0 prime. So let's go ahead and make an S1 prime. This is going to be our car now map. Has as its inputs S1, S0, and D. Do our gray code down to number the rows and zero and one to number the columns. And then we need another one for S zero prime. So S one and S zero are our inputs. Gray code down the side, zero, 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 one, 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 zero. And then D zero and one to identify the columns. All right, now it's just a matter of, of taking this truth table and converting it to the Carnell maps. So this, this top left-hand cell right here represents the 0, 0, 0 row. So 0, 0, 0, S1 prime is a 0, S0 prime is a 0. The next cell, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, S1 prime is a 0, S0 prime is a 1. 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. S1 prime is a zero, S0 prime is a zero. Next cell, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. S1 prime is a one, S0 prime is a zero. So we have a one and a zero. This cell right here, 1, 1, 0. We jump down to the seventh row, 1, 1, 0. Both cells, or both Carnell maps contain zeros. This cell right here, 1, 1, 1, takes us to the bottom row, 0, 1, 0, 1. I don't know, not looking all that pretty at this point, is it? This cell right here, 1, 0, 0, brings us up to the fifth row, 1, 0, 0, where both of them are 1s. And then we go to this cell right here, 1, 0, 1. 1, 0, 1 is a 1 and a 0. Not all that pretty, not all that pretty. We've done some nicer Carnell maps in the past, haven't we? 
Now, the Carnell map is just a, a graphical representation of what's in the truth table. So we are going to get rid of the truth table in order to make some room for our expressions or for our circuit, okay? Now, I've got, let's do this in a slightly different color. I've got in S1 prime, I've got a rectangle there and I've got a little one by one right there. S0, goodness, we've got one little rectangle there, one little rectangle there, one little rectangle there. There are three products in that one. It's gonna take some room on the board to draw these guys. Now this cell right here, it is a one as long as S1 is a one and S0 is a zero. So that becomes S1 and with S0 bar. And then this guy, nothing drops out because we don't cross any borders. This is basically S1 is a zero, S0 is a one, and D is a one. So you get S1 bar, S0, D. And so that gives us our expression for, let's see, S1 prime is equal to S1 bar anded with S0 anded with D or with S1 ended with S0 bar. All right, there's one expression. Now we just need the third one, don't we? The third one, well, goodness. <laughs> these, nothing drops out of any of these expressions. So we've got this guy right here. This is a one when S1 is a one, S0 is a zero, and D is a zero. So S1 ended with S0 bar ended with D bar, all right? I think we got that right. Made it a little messy, but got it right. So that one is S1, S0 bar, D bar. And then this guy right here, this is a one when S1 is a one, S0 is a one, and D is a one. This becomes S1 anded with S0 anded with D. And then this guy right here is S1 is a zero, S0 is a zero, and D is a one. So this becomes S1 bar anded with S0 bar anded with D. And so our final expression is S0 prime is equal to this one. So that's, uh, my goodness, kind of ran the bar together to the arrow, didn't I? So that becomes S1 ended with S0 bar ended with D bar, or with, I probably should have renumbered the states to make a little bit simpler expression, shouldn't I have? And it's too late now. So this guy right here is S1 ended with S0 ended with D, or with this last product here, which is S1 bar, S0 bar, D. All right. So we've got all of our expressions. We've got our output logic. We've got our next state logic. We know that with two bits, we know how much memory that we need. Well, let's go ahead and design our circuit. So in the middle here, Remember, we need our 2D flip-flops. So we'll have 2D flip-flops, D clock Q, D clock Q. We will attach the clocks together and have that run into a system clock. Now remember, the system clock is going to be in sync with the bits as they come into our system. In other words, every time we get a new D bit, we're gonna get a clock pulse, all right? And then we have our output F, now, the Q's, one Q is gonna be S1, the other Q is gonna be S0. Together, they're going to define our output logic. And so if you look up here, F is equal to the AND, the product of S1 ANDed with zero. So I'm just gonna make an AND gate here, and AND S1 and S0 together. That's the output logic. Wish the input logic was gonna be that simple, but it's not, all right? Now, this, remember, this is the memory, this is the output logic. What goes here is the next state logic. All right, that's what goes here. Now, what does it look like? Well, remember, I need to bring S1 
and S0 back to be able to compute what the next state is. Remember, the next state bits depend on all three of those. And where do they go? Well, remember, the input to D for the S1 flip-flop is S1 prime, and the input to D to the S0 flip-flop is S0 prime. Let's start with S1 prime. S1 prime is going to be the OR of two products. All right, two, two AND gates. So this becomes S1 bar ANDed with S0 ANDed with D. So that correspond, this AND gate corresponds to this product right there. Then we've also got this AND gate, which is going to be S1 ANDed with S0 bar. So S1 ANDed with S0 bar. And that takes care of the circuit for S1 prime. Might not have enough room for S0 prime. Let's go ahead and try. So I've got S0. That's going to be a sum of products expression also. It's going to involve the ORing of 1, 2, 3 AND gates. Can't say it's going to be pretty. All right. Now. What do we have? Well, this top product right here is going to be S1 ended with S0 bar ended with D bar. So this becomes S1, S0 bar, D bar. This one right here is going to be S1, S0, D. So all three of them just anded together. So S1, S0, and D. Now this one right here is going to be S1 bar ANDed with S0 bar ANDed with D. So S1 bar ANDed with S0 bar ANDed with D. Okay. Wow. Anyway, that is the circuit. And the, and, and the way we'll look at this is, remember, when we start out, we have a 0, 0 on S1 and S0 bar. When both of them are equal to zero, we're going to have a zero on our output F. These guys come back here, and we've got zero here and a zero here. Well, if I've got a zero here, what happens is the AND gate here has a one zero zero. It's outputting a zero. And the AND gate here has a zero and a one, so it's also outputting a zero. So the output of this guy is going to be a zero. This one right here, however, has a, like there's going to be a 0, 1, 1. It's still outputting a 0. This one right here is going to have all three zeros at its input. It's going to output a 0. And then this one right here has a 1, 1 with the inverted zeros, and then a 0 coming in from D. It's also going to be outputting a 0, so it's going to output a 0 there. And so as long as we keep ticking, and as long as D is equal to a 0, then we're going to stay in state 0, 0. But if D turns to a 1, all four of these top four AND gates are going to remain the same, but this bottom AND gate right here, it's going to have 0 going through an inverter to become 1, 0 going through an inverter to become 1, and then 1. So this is going to be 1 AND 1 AND 1, which is a 1, which is going to change the output of this OR gate to a 1, which means the next state clocked in going to be a 1. And we'll end this, so whenever you get that clocked in, this will be a one, 0, 1, which will bring us to the next state. And you could actually work through the state diagram that way in order to determine, hey, this logic works. And it does. So there you go. A way we can detect a pattern with a, uh, with a, a state machine. Now, something important to notice is that I could have made any of, uh, any of eight different patterns here that we were going to detect. The final state diagram is always going to have four states. It's going to have the no bits detected, the one bit detected, the two bits detected, and then the all bits detected. It's going to always have those states. The transitions, however, are what define exactly what pattern it is that we're going to decipher or find with this state diagram or with this state machine.